What are thoughts made of? The short, oversimplified answer is salt water. But for a more in-depth explanation, stay tuned. This is Grayson. Welcome to another Based Theory. Now, many of you might be saying, well, thoughts are events or ongoing actions. They're not a thing or an object that could be made of some material. But if we think about a waterfall as an analogy, which is also an event or an ongoing action, waterfalls are still made up of material substances. Water, primarily. And it is exactly this analogy that we will use to describe what thoughts are made out of. You see, because any action or event is ultimately made up of some material. A soccer game, for example, is also made up of material. Mostly soccer players, turf, a stadium, etc. People might think of, well, thoughts are neural activity, which is electricity, right? So maybe electrons would be what thoughts are made out of. But thoughts are not exactly the same as an electrical circuit, which is a movement of electrons. You see, because the electrical activity in the brain is not from the movement of electrons, but charged ions. Now, ions are just atoms that either have extra electrons or are missing electrons and thus either have a positive or a negative charge. Primarily in the brain, we're talking about sodium and potassium ions, which have a positive charge. Now, you might say that, well, thoughts are made of neurons, the cells in our brain. But... We can also think of neurons as being a bit like shepherds and the ions being like sheep. The neurons are directing what's called action potentials, which is just the flow of ions that moves through neural networks. And the neurons are just directing these ion flows by opening and closing little gates that they have all along their little tendrils. Now, if you know much about neurobiology, then you might say, ah, but Grayson, there's more than just the ions. There's also the neurotransmitters. You see, at every junction where two neurons meet, called a synapse, they exchange all kinds of different chemicals called neurotransmitters. But the primary effect that these neurotransmitters end up having is modulating the flow of ions. So ultimately, the neurons and neurotransmitters, though a very important part of neural activity, are ultimately modulating the flow of these ions, which is what really counts. Much like you can't really have a waterfall without having a cliff or some kind of physical solid thing for the water to flow off of but without the water obviously there's no waterfall involved and most people would say that the waterfall is primarily made of the water so it is in this analogy that we will say that the thought is primarily the ions so why salt water well <laughs> salt water is sodium chloride ions primarily salts are ions so, in a kind of interesting, oversimplified way, you can say that the actual physical material of which thoughts are composed are flowing salt ions in water, or just salty water. Which opens all kinds of interesting thought experiments, like if you could somehow direct salt water in a bucket to flow in the same way that the salt water in my brain is flowing right now, would that bucket of water have a conscious experience? Well, it's very possible that that could be the case. It is also important to note that when we think about where thoughts occur in the brain, that we need to keep in mind, pun intended, that thoughts are not just insular things. They involve networks of neural activity. And this is one of the reasons why we think anesthesia may disrupt consciousness. Because anesthesia causes the brain to fire in a rhythmic pattern, sort of like in a sports stadium when the crowd all raises their hands up in, a, in an order going around the stadium. Anesthesia kind of does this for our neural activity. When you are under anesthesia, your brain is still very active, 
However, the actual networks of neural firing, the communication between brain areas is disrupted, and instead the brain areas are all kind of firing in a unison pattern. And it's believed that the what is related to consciousness is the communication between these brain areas, and that pretty much every thought is going to involve multiple brain areas in complex patterns and loops of activity, neural circuits. So when we think about where a thought is in the brain, it's often going to be a complicated network of different brain areas involved. Although for most thoughts, it's definitely going to involve the very front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex is going to be involved in most kinds of executive action, thinking, conscious thoughts, etc. But there's also going to be other areas like the parietal cortex, which is involved in thinking about spatial relationships between concepts and objects. There's the temporal cortex, which is the kind of helps you understand and relate concepts uh, with relationships between words and ideas, especially with time. The hippocampus. Uh, which is the sort of memory center of the brain and allows you to draw upon past experiences and knowledge. Um, there's also really important overall networks that are distributed in multiple brain areas, like the default mode network, which is involved in like self-referential thinking and you know when your mind wanders or maybe you have creative intrusions of thoughts. So all of these brain areas are going to be involved in most complex thoughts, but you know, primarily you're going to have networks involving all of these different areas at once. But again, most of the thoughts are probably going to light up in the front of your brain, just in case you're curious about where your thoughts are occurring in your brain. But this all kind of goes back to the sort of hard problem of consciousness. That is relating the neural activity uh, and the molecular processes going on in the brain to our conscious experience. And this is probably one of the coolest frontiers of neuroscience uh, that is still ongoing in our understanding, but I'm very optimistic that maybe sometime within my lifetime, maybe within the next 100 years, that we will continue to deeper our understanding of the molecular mechanisms involved in consciousness and truly to understand what consciousness is on a deep, fundamental, molecular level. And we are seeing at least some progress in the most in the recent decades in this area. Like we have a way deeper understanding of neural synaptic uh, plasticity than we did just a couple decades ago, um, way down on the molecular level. And that's uh, plasticity in the brain is is basically you know involved in in memory in learning. It's it's basically how your brain remodels itself over time based on your thoughts, reinforcing certain patterns of thoughts and letting go of others, basically molding your brain over the years. There also continues to be progress in what's called neural correlates of consciousness, which is essentially the minimal amount of neural activity needed to create a certain conscious experience. There has also been major progress in the field called connectomics, which is the study of mapping out the connections between neurons in the brain. And this field began in about the 80s when the most simple brain, those of nematodes that only have like 300 or so neurons, was fully mapped out with all the synapses and connections to such to the point that we can actually model this in computer simulations and make synthetic nematodes that behave identically to the originals. Now, this field has continued to develop since, and it's only been just within the 2020s that scientists have published the complete connectome for a fruit fly, which was a major accomplishment. There's something like 500,000 synapses in a fruit fly. So we're continuing to progress. Next up, they're trying to publish the complete connectome for a mouse, which is a significantly harder endeavor, but eventually the idea being that we may be able to map out the complete connectome for the human brain, which would tell us all of the relationships on a molecular level of what leads to the emergence of consciousness. These are the kinds of fields to be on the lookout for in our understanding of, you know, the 
understanding what the mind is in terms of matter and material. And this is one of the fields that I am the most looking forward to seeing progress in during my lifetime. There has also been some speculation from like Roger Penrose and some others that quantum effects may play a role in the emergence of consciousness. Now, I won't totally dismiss this idea. After all, there are quantum effects that have been known to happen in biochemical systems like in photosynthesis and some other types of proteins and enzymes can take advantage of quantum effects. But I'm still a little bit doubtful for the actual mechanism for how these quantum effects would come into play in the development of consciousness as an emergent phenomenon from neural activity. So I'm skeptical for now, but not totally dismissive. But yeah, just keep in mind, next time somebody says something about electricity in your brain, what they're really talking about is the coordinated flow of salt water. Anyways, guys, I know this was a shorter video, but I kind of like these bite-sized bits of science videos. So we'll see if I am able to do that in the next based theory, which was a tie for the winner of the last poll along with this subject. And that will be the next generation of particle accelerators and what kind of new physics we might discover from it. So until then, guys, keep learning, stay curious, and have a great day.